In this video blog, Josh Welton talks to fellow welder Nate Bowman. Widely known as Weld Scientist in the welding community, Nate Bowman is the Director of Welding Optimization and Education at Central Welding Supply. He is a CWI, CWE, and CWS, and a well-established social media welding influencer. Nate offers up his knowledge of welding science to inspire others to take their welding careers to the next level. All right, I'm Josh Walton. I'm here with my good friend, Nate Bowman, and we are discussing, well, we were discussing aliens, yeah, basically. Yeah, basically, but then Bob Lazar. he got into, yes, Bob Lazar, he got into the genesis of when he became the well scientist and why he did that. Yeah, so um, basically like Hoonigan, like Hoonigan is like content king. Yep. Like there, Hoonigan means nothing, it is nothing, it's just like a word that they came up with. So I was weld economics for a minute. Yep. Like I was trying to figure out like, what is this thing? Like, what does this mean? And I was like, I need like a, like an identity. Like you have a welder it's assassin, a which is dope. It's a branding. Um, but so I like, I needed something that like kind of, I don't know, like when I think of a scientist, like a scientist, a real scientist, wants everybody to know all the information. Yes. Um, I know you're not a huge Elon Musk fan, but <laughs> I do like, his approach to being like, hey, like, you guys want to try and build this? Like, go for it. Yeah, exactly. Like, um, th we're doing, like, anybody No limitations. Yeah, yeah like, there's no limits. Yeah. Everything's open source. We're pushing the limits of everything. Like, we want everybody to know all of the information. And that's kind of, like, why I created this weld scientist thing was, like, hey, like, all the data that I have should be available for everyone. That's, like, when I say on any podcast or any, like, video anywhere, I'm like, if you want to know where to set your machine, send me a message. Let me know what you're welding. I'll tell you how to right. set it. Because there's an exact setting that works for everything. Right. And I don't feel like that information should be like hidden from I mean, people. people don't think about things like deposition rate and, uh, you know, the there's infinite ways you can set up to, to pulse or to run different yeah. frequencies or whatever. Like, there's more There's than one way to do it. Yes. And I think that people don't understand like that the settings are like how you weld something or how I weld something or how your brush feet, weld something. Your feed might be different. Your angle might be a little bit different. And so giving people the tools that you have yes. to figure out for themselves what is my ideal setting. Right. So it's like, hey, this is where I run this. This is where we've tested it. We've had multiple welders test at these settings. Yeah. And we've found that they're consistent results. We've, we've tested hundreds and hundreds of people We've macroed, we've done bend testing, we've seen that like, hey, this setting at 350 inches a minute, 19.7 volts on three eighths material, like you're gonna get penetration in the root every single time. Right. And a hundred welders have tested to this and, and have all, passed. Yeah. So like, that's like a, Proven. that's what I would say is like a data point. Yeah. So okay. um, that's kind of where I came up with the idea for the weld scientist thing. I'm like, I'm gonna just be like a resource for the industry. Yeah. There's a lot of, tips and tricks and pointers and things like that but i'm like a data guy i want to give you guys the numbers yeah exactly I, I one of the things that drives me nuts is that everyone's like well what are your what were your settings for this it's like you want to figure out why you're getting those settings yeah. not just that it's you know this this feed rate this this amount of amps or whatever it's like what are you welding why are you coming up with that yeah and not just the but because there's a difference between to me mig welding is there's a there's a lot more art to mig welding than most people want to appreciate yeah. Yeah. and that comes when you're not just a production welder where they set you down and you're running the same foot section for you know 12 hours or eight hours a day or whatever it is you actually have to fine-tune the machine to yourself yeah and if not enough welders have those tools and then you can back it up with like you said with the destructive testing with the non-destructive testing something that not everyone has one-on-one -on -one access to but yeah. through proxy they can have access to it through you yeah and so when they're welding their hot rod in their garage they can be pretty sure that what they're doing is going to work yeah so it's like really like kind of like establishing like a minimum yeah so it's like hey man if you well kind of like what every cert is it's like this is going to work this yeah. is if you do it this way this will work yeah and if you don't deviate from this like you get plus or minus 10 percent of wire feed speed seven percent of voltage like for like pretty much any code stuff okay so when you when we when we say that we're going to test something so let's say you're welding like quarter inch material and you have 035 70 s6 so if i say you know, I'm gonna make this weld at this contact tip to this, or contact tip to work distance, this gun angle, this travel speed, all the stuff. I make this weld, we cut it open, we know that we have fusion at the root. And it's like 30, 40 thousandths of fusion. 
So we know that plus or minus 10% of the wire feed speed and voltage, you're still gonna get the same results no matter what machine you run. Right. Now, a lot of people can't run at super high wire feed speed, so they'll turn it down. They're like, oh, it's too fast for me. You know, or I'm like getting a huge weld. Then you just gotta figure out the other parameters and where to adjust to compensate for that, right? Yeah, so it's, the big thing is like, the, the machine, especially with MIG welding, like a robot knows nothing about how to like how to make a weld. Right. It needs gun angle, travel speed, and contact tip to work distance, like, and then all your points. So you're you position the gun in the joint, and then you say, hey, go from here to here at this many inches per minute. Well, deposition rate, so like when you set your wire feed speed, you're setting how much weld metal's going into that joint. So we can calculate that, we use that calculation to determine what the travel speed is. Right. So I can say, hey, at this wire feed speed, and you want to make this size weld, you have to go this fast in order to make this size weld. Yeah. Um, why that matters, I guess, for, for welders and stuff, is if you deviate from that, and you go slower, the weld's going to be bigger. If you go faster, the weld's going to be smaller. Yep. But a lot of people can't handle like spray transfer. A lot of people aren't welding at these like super high wire feed speeds. Like they're yep. just like, oh, it's too hot for me. What I'm seeing, like average in the industry, people weld between four and six pounds an hour, like in, in big welding gotcha. process. Um, so that's like uh, 035 solid wire, 350 inches a minute is like five and a half pounds an hour for reference. So 500 inches a minute with 035 solid wire is like nine, nine pounds an hour. So and that's, is that typical for for pulse welding or spray transfer or that's any anything? any process? You set your wire feed speed to 350 inches a minute. That's the upper end of short circuit. When you get beyond that, um, you're going to be in like that globular, globular. range. But I love that word globular. globular. So great. It's, it's like <laughs> sounds a like so unscientific. It's like they're it like, is. what do we call this? It's like glob. It's like globs. Globs. They're like write that down. Globular. Technical term. So spray transfer happens when you hit what's called transition current. So transition current's affected by like wire diameter and your shielding gas. Yes. So the less CO2 you have in your shielding gas mix, the lower your transition current. The skinnier your wire, the lower the transition current. The bigger wire, you know, needs more amperage. So what happens in pulse is you're flipping the transition current. So where pulse comes in handy is if you want to like reduce your heat input. Heat inputs volts times amps times 60 divided by your travel speed. So you, you can turn your volts only down so far. Well, your amperage is determined by what your wire diameter and your wire feed speed is. Well, you can only turn it down so far before you lose penetration. Right. So if you're like, hey, I'm getting distortion, I wanna reduce my heat input, I wanna like pull at some of these like variables here, well, you can put it in pulse where you can still have that pulse spray, so you can get into spray transfer where the machine's pulsing that amperage and it's hitting the transition current and shooting a droplet across the arc multiple times a second. So that's what's happening in pulse. Spray transfer is like you're literally set at DC current above that transition current. So your wire feed speed's high enough that it's carrying enough current that you're in spray transfer. Okay. I know this shit is getting deep. We're in it. We're in yeah. it. Now, now we're in it. So I don't know why this matters, but if you're not does, if you're not in if you're not in short circuit and you're not in spray transfer, you're in globular. You're gonna get spatter. You're not gonna have a good time, and your perception of how this machine is running is not gonna be great. There's it, there's no consistency. Like it, it doesn't feel consistent. Right. Like yeah. There's like so short circuit just has this like super consistent place where it runs really nice. Yep. People say like oh it's supposed to sound like frying bacon. It's not quite. Not quite. It's like frying bacon if a robot was frying bacon. Yes. Like a perfect. The more perfect sizzle you can get the more in tune your arc is not, gonna be. Not too many of the high pops, not too many of the low pops, it's that nice, yeah. consistent, I, I, yeah, totally. If you're making welds, like I say this all the time, if you're making welds and they're getting spatter, the, the solution off. is not anti-spatter. The solution yeah. is the correct Dude, weld I setting. hate anti-spatter. Me too. Oh, it's the devil. They did that big test, like, I love fireball tools, don't get me wrong, they do some awesome stuff, they do lots of great testing on YouTube, but he did the test with like all the different types of anti-spatter, and they like were everybody was posting like the anti spatter thing on that like on, on Instagram like oh, oh I, 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 I love that. this anti spatter I love this anti spatter I use this anti spatter no. and I posted like a black box in the like white lettering it says the best anti spatter is the correct, correct weld settings. yeah the correct weld setting <laughs> love it I mean because if you're getting spatter <laughs> if you're getting spatter you're welding you either I mean you're gonna get spatter with like sixty ten you know yeah self shielded wire certain things that are unavoidable sure. 
welding on garbage. Yeah, like you're gonna get spatter. But if you're making welds on new parts or you're doing a repair, you're cleaning something, yep. if you're getting spatter, either you haven't prepped your you haven't prepped your weld joint. Yep. It's easier to weld it right the first time than exactly. it is to like sometimes it can be almost impossible to fix it because like yeah. one of the things that drives me nuts is when people put parts together and they give it to you to weld and it's like well do you clean the heat affected like where the oh, heat affected under, is yeah, underneath yeah. like that's get, as soon as you put heat to it it's whether especially aluminum but even with steel it's going to suck any impurity or any anything that contaminate right into the heat right into your weld a it's, lot of people too will fit a part up and then try to clean the joint afterwards yes. like you're, yeah yeah so if you have like a laser cut part or a plasma part that like that whole edge you know so if you're fitting two pieces together like yeah you might be clean on the top of this one place, gotta clean that but edge. then you put that other joint in there and they're like yeah we clean the joint but clean it after there's still yeah. like that carbon on the bottom yep. side and when you and you it's know, no matter how you whether it's like the water jet leaves residue the sand residue yeah. in it uh some people think that they can sandblast parts and then weld it right it's, you're literally throwing dirt at the part like you still need to clean that yeah. before you weld yeah. on it yeah, no, I, I'm I'm totally with you on that. Just I, clean it. I, you could grind before, or you can grind after. Yeah, grind, grind do it before. It, it makes everything. It makes life. And so then you much don't easier. grind it all. Anymore. Put the weld in. It looks beautiful. Thanks for watching part one of Josh's interview with Nate Bowman. Stay tuned for part two as Nate dives into his passion for welding photography.